We begin with that breaking More than news. 6, a state of emergency in California. There, the fire deadly now fires now exploded the from the state. President Trump is ordering federal California. assistance Quickly. to help with the disaster. Whipping winds and rain. It is one of the largest, if not the largest, we've ever seen the in the Atlantic hurricane What's being basin. called a superstorm tonight. 60 you million track, people will be affected. Hundreds of thousands have already been evacuated tonight. The amount of heat trapping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is top 400 parts per million. Sobering climate news. If unprecedented changes are not made and made soon, the there will be irreversible damage to the planet. We have until 2030 to avoid catastrophe. The aspects of environmental change that make us pay attention, that are made visible, tend to be big, catastrophic, apparently instantaneous. A wildfire, a hurricane, a river in flames, Environmental change isn't only visible through these kinds of stochastic events, though. There are smaller steps, changes that happen over time, that sometimes take a keener eye or a more intimate relationship with a place to notice. Changes that build up to or remain long past those big events. In Ungrounded, we explore how these changes can creep up on us, making what was once considered normal a thing of the past, and what was once considered shocking seem unremarkable. Ungrounded is an interdisciplinary mixed media project using photography, maps, digital collage, and text from interviews to highlight people's experiences with environmental change in places they're intimately familiar with. The idea for the project came about around 2018. An IPCC report, the one that gave humanity 12 years to act on climate change, had just come out. There were all kinds of extreme weather events in the news, very intense atmospheric rivers, and bomb cyclones. Wildfires were getting worse, and there was one that was bad enough in fall of that year that classes at Stanford were canceled. It felt like climate change was here in full force, but it also felt like no one was noticing. We'd hear people talking about wildfires in California as if they'd always been this way, but they hadn't. Things weren't always the way that they are now. Before high school, we'd never had classes canceled because of wildfire smoke. This was something new. People not from here didn't seem to realize that. Both of us had lived in the same place our entire lives, but suddenly things weren't feeling the same anymore. In Silent Spring, Rachel Carson writes, there's something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. But what happens when those refrains don't repeat anymore, when they're disrupted or out of order? In the past couple of years, we came across work that seemed to be getting at something similar. Rob Nixon's idea of slow violence, Peter Kahn's term environmental amnesia, Pete Muller's exploration of solastalgia. These were some of the threads we wanted to bring together in Ungrounded. In its final state, it's a series of works exploring environmental memory, connection to place, solastalgia, and emotional displacement. It also investigates some of the challenges of scientific communication. You see these maps of rising temperatures, drought, fire, and extreme storms all over the news. And they're jarring, but they're also a bit abstract. Why is there sometimes a disconnect between what people can see in the news and what they experience? Why has environmental change been treated as so distant when it's happening here and now? A lot of this project is grounded in ecology, which is related to the older field of natural history, which focuses on studying the environment and organisms through close observation. There's still a lot that ecologists and earth scientists learn about the environment from just using their bodies and their senses. But people are also constantly learning about the environment, its physical inhabitants, and its most reliable patterns by just living in it. And you notice when those inhabitants or patterns change and when things start to feel off balance. So there are multiple ways of knowing about the environment. You can study it scientifically, but we also study it every day by living in it. And then even using the same method of observation, you can draw scientific conclusions, but you can also draw personal connections between yourself and the environment. 
Part of what we're doing in this project is interviewing people and asking them about how they remember places that are important to them. How have they witnessed environmental change in a place they're very familiar with or connected to? What did this place used to be like and how did they start to notice changes? What feelings does this bring up? This was a research process on our part where we're learning about these different forms of environmental knowledge and knowledge production, thinking about how individual experiences serve as a form of data about environmental change. We used a style of ethnographic interview commonly used in the field of design. Within design, these interviews are often approached as a rigorous science, gathering lots of data and sorting it away into neat findings and insights that are then presented as the whole story. But the narrowing and simplifying of information inherent to the current methods within science can sometimes create an incomplete picture. We look for what a group all has in common instead of trying to find what makes each individual interviewee unique and highlighting that. It feels like, even though we talk to so many people and learn their stories and struggles, that personal touch is lost in the data synthesis and they become just another data point. But at the same time, ethnographic research is a fantastic way to learn about people. The open-ended, conversational-style interviews allow us to get much more intimate answers than the typical rigid question and answer. And I think most importantly to this project, Interviewing other people outside of ourselves allows us to hear and interact with many different types of stories, helping us empathize and understand others to a deeper extent. So, with Ungrounded, we take this design practice of centering the stories of people, but combine it with the more open and flexible expression that is possible through visual arts. Through ethnographic research, we are able to hear a lot of stories, and by creating a unique piece or set of unique pieces from each individual interview, we can provide a wider understanding of each person we interact with. Climate change is often seen as a far off occurrence. So by highlighting stories of people's firsthand experience with environmental change, we hope to prompt the audience to think about how it might also be affecting their own lives and think about how they relate to, interact with, and observe the environment every day. After interviewing folks, we conducted photo shoots with them and also had them send us any photos they had of the places they talked about. In some cases, we also sourced photos of what they talked about online. We brought together their portraits and these photos of place in a series of digital collages inspired by the topics they talked about in their interviews. The other component of our collages are maps. People probably encounter maps quite often in stories about environmental change or catastrophic events. Environmental science relies heavily on maps as tools for analysis and communication, and they're very powerful because sometimes they have both spatial and temporal elements to them. But they also have certain weaknesses. They often operate at a really large scale. They can decontextualize and standardize data, flatten complexity, only take into account very specific types of quantitative knowledge, and present themselves as objective when they actually reflect the values and interests of the people who construct them. In our project, we're grounding maps in experiences and stories of individual people to question what people mean by scientific objectivity and how certain types of data are differentially valued. We use them to connect abstract phenomena to the people experiencing them. The collage and manipulation also give us the freedom to visually express experiences and emotions that aren't talked about in environmental sciences. Feminist scholar Donna Haraway uses photography and cameras as a conduit to explain different ways of seeing. She writes, The eyes made available in modern technological sciences shatter any idea of passive vision. These prosthetic devices show us that all eyes, including our own organic ones, are active perceptual systems building on translations and specific ways of seeing. This pushes back against the idea of scientific objectivity or the idea of scientists being neutral or passive observers and analysts of information. When in reality, all knowledge is affected by a person's social position and objectivity is a performance. The fact that no one can be truly neutral isn't always bad. Our own positionality allows us to see and talk about things in a unique way. In this light, the portraits in Ungrounded reinforce the fact that each person's experience of environmental change is not only unique and different, but also important and valuable. The final collection brings together these different perspectives to try and create a fuller, more comprehensive view of this shared experience.